Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anubhav, and I'm technical marketing engineer here at Cisco. Uh, I work on uh, cloud security, so majorly involved on next generation firewall, NASA in public and private cloud. So before we start this uh, session, uh, this session is uh, for 120 minutes. Just wanted to set the base up. Just wanted to tell you that what I would be covering today. Since this is a level two session, I would be focusing a little bit on basics as well. So things like what is a virtual private cloud? What is a VNet? How exactly you can insert security when you move your workloads to public cloud? Uh, with me, I have Eric Waterworth. Uh, he is a technical leader for uh, these virtual appliances in public cloud, and he's taking care of hypervisor vir virtual appliances as well. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I like traveling. Outside of work, I like traveling, clicking pictures. And I've also added my contact information. So I added this contact information because if you are stuck anywhere on deploying or if you have any question related to architecture or anything related to virtual appliances in public cloud, feel free to drop me an email. I'm pretty quick in responding to my email. However, if I'm traveling, you might expect some delay as well. Uh, I have also added my YouTube channel. So whenever we test any new deployment or any use case, because we work with a lot of customers and partners, right? So we understand what is your requirement and how we can fulfill uh, by providing security using virtual ASA or NGFWE. So the moment we test anything, we post that video there as well. So you can quickly uh, go there, subscribe to the channel to stay updated. I have also included my public folder. So I, after every session, I post my public content in this particular folder as well. I'm with Cisco for uh, around almost 10 years. So I started my career from Cisco Tax Security Team. Then I moved into ASABU. And from last four years, I'm part of technical marketing team and working on securing your on-premise data center and cloud. Now, we also have a WebEx team for this particular session, and Eric would be answering those questions. So if you have any question related to anything specific, you can uh, post it in the, uh, in, the, in the WebEx team, and we will answer that question. And even after this session, we'll spend 30, 15 to 30 minutes to answer your questions. If you have any question, feel free to approach us, and we will be more than happy to answer those questions as well. Now, in this deck, I have more than uh, 250 slides. So I don't want to bore you to sleep by showing you step-by-step -step installation of firewalls. Rather, rather than that, I will focus on deep diving on these virtual appliances use cases. So if you are referring to this slide on your, on your laptop or on your mobile phone, uh, you might not see few slides here uh, because those slides are your, for your reference. Let's talk about agenda. So I am going to start off with introduction to public cloud. I'm sure that you are already there in public cloud. So before I start, just wanted to understand how many of you are using next generation firewall or ASA already? A oh, good, good number, okay. How many of you are new to public cloud? Okay. Good, okay, we have few people who are new to public cloud. And how many of you are already using virtual appliances, whether in the data center or in cloud, okay? Okay, that's great. So in the introduction part, I will talk about benefits and challenges in public cloud, why people are moving to public cloud, when people move to public cloud, what kind of challenges they face. And then I will talk about native components of Amazon and Azure as well, where I will start from basics like AWS and Azure. Then I will insert security into public cloud by adding next generation firewall and ASA. In the end, I will also focus on advanced security integration. So we have integration with um, Stealth Watch for cloud. We have AMP integration for the day zero uh, threat protection. And we have recently came out with Umbrella Connector on ASA. I will talk about that as well. And I will also give you a few reference links, config guides, and TDM. So let's begin. So a few years ago, it was uh, 
a phase where everything was inside the data center. So everything was inside the data center and you had full control over all your workloads, all your resources. You had full visibility. You had layer two visibility, layer three, layer up till layer seven. So you can control anything. But when you move into public cloud, just wanted to understand, is your on-premise data center still uh, still a complete requirement. I guess all of you are now moving into public cloud because of many regions, re reasons, right? So it is becoming a multi-cloud world where you are moving your workloads from your data center to public cloud. It can, it can be to Amazon Web Services, to Azure, or you are connecting your data center to these providers as well. So based on these numbers, if, if you see 85% 80, of customers are evaluating public cloud or they are using it already, and 87%, if they are already in public cloud, they are thinking about multi-cloud environment. And if you look at Gartner's report, you, you can see this, they, they, this business is around $45 uh, billion. So, Think of this number as because I see a lot of customers are already moving there because of many re regions like application agility. So you have application agility. So imagine you want to provision a new server. In public cloud, it's pretty easy. You go to your portal, request for a machine, just provision it, and you are done. Now you need to protect that server as well because uh, you are not in your in your data center now. It's somebody else's data center, and you need to have similar kind of visibility and threat protection that you have in your data center, okay? The second thing, important thing, why customers are moving or why you are moving to public cloud is scalability. It is highly scalable. You can use features like auto scale. You can scale your workloads. When there is a high load on your workload, you can scale it, and load balancer can do the magic, provide services to your end customers. On the high availability side, public cloud is pretty flexible. They have multiple regions across the globe, so you can take use of that as well. So when I started working on public cloud a few years ago, I saw a trend where they started with per hour billing. Then they went to per minute billing, and they are now down to one second billing as well. So it is pretty flexible. So that is the reason companies are going towards public cloud. So when you move to public cloud, it comes with challenges as well. When I talk about challenge, biggest challenge is layer two abstraction. So you don't have complete layer two visibility. Because of that, features like HA, features like uh, sending GRP or moving interfaces, those kind of features are pretty difficult to achieve in public cloud. Other important thing is when you connect your data center to public cloud, you need to consider how exactly you will connect your data center to cloud because uh, there are multiple uh, technologies available. You have direct connect, express route, or even IPsec. You can use co-location facility as well and use direct connect. So it's really important how exactly when you are connected to your data center, how exactly you are securing your data, and do you have complete visibility or not? So that is really important. Security is a big factor. So you are using ASA and next generation firewall in your data center. You have visibility, you are using tools like Firepower Management Center, CDO, or any other tool through which you are getting visibility. You may be using Stealth Watch, getting the NetFlow information and getting complete visibility on your tools. Now, if you want similar kind of visibility in cloud, it is really important to understand what kind of tool you will be using when you will move your workload to cloud. Now, when you move to public cloud, and if you are new, you will face challenges as well, because there are hundreds of services. So this is just a high-level information on what kind of services you will learn when you move to public cloud. So, uh, so each provider will have a different name, but they're providing similar kind of services. Just to give you an example, in Azure, you have virtual network. In Amazon Web Services, you have virtual private cloud. So things like that. So when you move there, you're confused. Because till this point, we are always working on the data center. We were working on VXLAN, VLAN, switches, routers, everything is new in cloud when you move there. So I'll talk about these important items as well. Mm -hmm. 
So let's begin with Amazon Web Services components. So first of all, we need to understand what is a region. So region is, uh, so first of all, they have 17 regions across the globe, and these regions are interconnected. So you can pick and choose any region, and then you can deploy your workloads in any of the region of your choice. Now, when you are in Amazon Web Services, first thing that you will deploy is your virtual private cloud. Now, what is a virtual private cloud? Virtual private cloud is your virtual environment. You will have full control over all the resources that you will deploy in your virtual private cloud. So think of it as a container that you have where you will provision all your devices and you will have your virtual network there. Next thing is region. What is a region? Region is, think of it as, it as a data center, separate data center with redundant power, redundant network, and redundant cooling. So in K, you can provision your workloads in multi-region. So if there is a failure in one region, sec other region is not affected. Inside your availability zone, you will have your subnets. Subnets are similar to what you have today in your data center, so these are simple subnets. And in your subnets, you will deploy your workloads. So workloads in Amazon Web Services are known as EC2 instances, okay? Now, EC2 instances can be accessed using private IP address if you have some kind of backdoor connectivity to your cloud, or if you want to use it through internet, you have to assign public IP address, which is elastic IP address, or EIP. Load balancer is really important to understand when you are in cloud, because that is how you will do all the magic, okay? So you will terminate your front users on your external or internal load balancer, and then let the load balancer forward traffic to multiple firewalls. So I will talk about different kind of load balancers in the next slide, but just to give you some idea, we have network load balancer, application load ba balancer, and classical load balancer. Now for providing internet connectivity, it is really important to use internet gateway. By default, when you create your virtual private cloud, you will not get internet. You need IGW to provide it. And you also need a route table. In your route table, you will add a route, and your next stop becomes your internet gateway, or IGW. Till this point, you don't have internet already. You have to associate this route table to your subnet. So let's take an example. If you want to provide internet to your internal workloads, what you will do is you will create internet gateway, then you will create a route table, add a route in your route table, your next stop in the route table is going to be your internet gateway, and then you will go ahead and associate your route table to your inside subnet. That is how you provide internet connectivity. Then there is direct connect as well, which is uh, required for connecting your data center to your cloud environment. So it, it starts from uh, one gig and it can go up to 10 gig. So based on your requirement, you can go ahead and pick that. But thing to remember when you, are, when you connect using direct connect, connection is not encrypted. I'll talk about how to encrypt that connection in the upcoming slides, but just to give you some idea, direct connect is not encrypted. Now let's talk about load balancer. Why I'm talking about load balancer? Because when you will deploy your workloads in cloud, you will go ahead and scale your firewalls as well. Because today, you may start off with few workloads in public cloud, and later on, you might need more workloads, right? So these load balancers will play important role in that kind of deployment. So application load balancer will load balance traffic based on cookie, and it is not suggested when you add firewalls in the backend pool. Now, there is a network load balancer, which we recommend with firewalls, because in network load balancer, you can create target groups. Now, what is a target group? You can specify destination IP, okay? If you look at classical load balancer, classical load balancer can only forward traffic to primary interface of a VM. In this case, your backend VMs will be firewalls, okay? So classical load balancer is not a pretty good choice. The new load balancer, which is NLB, you can use that with ASA and next generation firewall both. Now let's talk about native cloud security components as well. So 
When you go to Amazon Web Services, you have options like Security Group and Network ACL. This will provide you visibility, or you can block traffic up till layer four. You can specify source, destination, port, and IP addresses. That's it. And if you look at action that you can take with, uh, with NSG, it is only deny. So you don't have, with, sorry, if it's security group, it's only deny. With network ACL, it's deny and allow both. So not pretty scalable if you have a big network and if you want to deploy multiple security policies, security rules, it might not be a good choice. Then you have things like connecting your data center to, uh, to cloud. So if you look at this particular example, you have your data center and you want to connect your data center to cloud. Now you first need your customer gateway. It, it can be a firewall or a router which is on premise and then you can terminate your VPN on Amazon VGW. Now, if you look at this particular example, you can create a site-to-site -site VPN, which is encrypted. You require static or dynamic routing. But let's say, how about visibility? You are controlling your firewalls on-prem, you have full visibility of what is happening in your network, and you are using the same firewall for going towards cloud, right? But on the other side, on AGW, you don't have complete visibility. So, so if you require single management visibility, you can provision firewalls on-prem, similar virtual version of that firewall in cloud as well, so that you can control it using single management plane, and you, will, you get the complete visibility as well. Now, let's talk a little bit about this particular device, VGW. If you look at VGW, it supports only pre-share key. So in some cases, you might require uh, certificates. And if you look at the IPsec thing, it, it is responder only. So you cannot really initiate tunnel from your cloud environment. It is route-based VPN. And if you have overlapping subnet. So I have seen when, when, when customer moves to public cloud, they simply pick up a slash 16 subnet, which will definitely overlap with their uh, on-premise data center. So if you are using VGW, uh, it's, uh, uh, it does not support overlapping network because there is no support for NAT on VGW. And it has limited visibility. Now let's talk about Direct Connect, okay? Direct Connect is something which is really important to understand because uh, this is where you want to secure your data. This is not an encrypted channel. So you can have co-location facility, and these co-location facilities will have direct connection going towards your cloud provider. It can be Azure or AWS or any other cloud provider as well. And you can use co-location facilities like Equinix. So in that particular situation, you still need security, right? So you can provision firewall on your data center, virtual device in cloud, and you can still take your IPsec traffic through your direct connect uh, connection. Another thing I would like to highlight is VPC peering. So I talked about VPC. Now you will see a lot of customers using multiple VPCs. And most of the times it is required that two VPCs should talk to each other. And how that connection will happen? It is through virtual private cloud peering or VPC peering. It is a high, high speed connection. And thing to remember is there is no transit uh, uh, no transit peering. So if you would like to have a hub and spoke model, you will have to create a transit VPC and then connect your other VPCs to a transit VPC. On the other hand, if you are using firewall, you can simply create VPN with all your VPCs and create your uh, full mesh uh, protected environment. Now, with this, I will go ahead and start off with basic components of Azure. Uh, similar kind of things there, but name, names are a little bit different. They have regions and availability zone. They came out uh, with availability zones a uh, few months ago. So similar concept, they have uh, 50, 140, uh, sorry, 50 regions across 140 countries. Now, when you deploy any new resource in Azure, you will deploy it in a resource group, okay? So first thing that you will create is your virtual network. Virtual network is similar to your virtual private cloud. Then you have subnets, your uh, workloads, user-defined routes. So how many of you are using a user-defined route already in the cloud? 
Okay, good. I can see a lot of hands. So this tool is a little bit flexible where you can have more specific routes. And uh, you can modify this route table using API calls as well. So I'll talk about API integration in a bit where we use uh, API integration for ASA VHA. Next thing is uh, network virtual appliances. On the NVA side, we have ASA and next generation firewall, which is available in marketplace of Amazon Web Services and Azure. We do it for public and golf cloud both. So if you have, if you have any customer who is in golf cloud, you can still find this virtual appliance there in the marketplace. Now, availability set is a little bit important to understand because it is kind of an attribute that you add to your firewall or to, a, to your VM. If you have multiple VMs in, in an availability set, Azure will make sure that your firewalls are deployed on separate hardware. So imagine if you deploy 50 firewalls and all the firewalls are on the same rack because Azure is not aware that these are the HA devices. So if you want to achieve HA or if you want to add firewalls behind a load balancer, you need to associate it to availability set. The moment you associate it to availability set, Azure will make sure that all the devices are on different hardware. So if they run any kind of hardware or software ma maintenance, nothing will happen to all your workloads. Load balancers, similar kind of load balancers are available in Azure as well, internal and external. Apart from internal and external, they have standard load balancer and basic load balancer. So basic load balancer is for uh, smaller deployments. When you have a bigger deployment, if you want to have more than more than 500 or 800 VMs behind load balancer, then you, go, you, you can go with standard load balancer as well. Now, next thing is Express Route. Express Route is similar to AWS Direct Connect. Uh, for this, you will require a virtual network gateway. Okay, so again, connection is not encrypted. You can use IPsec tunnel to secure your connection. And why IPsec tunnel is important? I, I have seen a trend where you have a big pipe of express route and you're sharing that pipe with multiple subscriptions. So one subscription might be used by a different department, other subscription might be used by a different department. So some kind of encryption is required. On the security side um, in Azure, they have NSGs. Now, NSG is similar to security group, but it can be applied at the interface level uh, or it can be applied at the subnet level as well. Uh, again, uh, you can use virtual network gateway or VGW for connecting your data center to cloud, site-to-site uh, -site VPN, encrypted traffic policy and uh, route-based VPN, but if you look at the maximum number of tunnels, so it supports 30 VPN tunnels. So if your network is pretty big, uh, it is not a scalable solution. You might have to look at third-party solutions as well, like uh, we have ASA, Next Generation Firewall. Now, a little bit in depth on a virtual gateway. It supports policy-based, route-based VPN, pre-share keys, active and passive VPN, maximum tunnel 30, um, no support for overlapping subnets again. So I'm definitely sure. Uh, how many of you are running into a situation where your cloud and your data center has an overlapping network? Okay, okay, few. I'm sure uh, when you will move your workloads to public cloud, a uh, few more will see this kind of challenge. So it is really important to have some kind of appliance which can provide you uh, a mechanism using which you can NAT your traffic, but if you're going with this virtual appliance, there is no support for NATing. Connecting your data center to cloud using Express Route. So Azure came out with a uh, 10 gig uh, virtual, uh, sorry, Express Route as well. They start with 50 meg and they can go up to uh, 10 gig. Again, connection is not shared. For this, you have to involve your, uh, your co-location facility as well. Now, when you connect your VNet to another network or another VNet, VNet peering is required. So it is, again, a high-speed connection between two devices, okay? So kind of uh, similar to VPC peering. Um, only difference is if you need to peer two regions or uh, uh, 
two uh, VNets in two different regions, you would require a global VNet peering. Now, this is a little bit about the load balancer, Azure load balancer. First one is the basic load balancer, which will do your load balancing based on five tuple. And you have to write your load balancing rules. Okay, so any traffic that you want to load balance, you have to have uh, your load balancing rule on your load balancer. But if you are using standard load balancer, it has a functionality which is known as HA port, which can load balance all your TCP and UDP traffic. You don't have to write rule on that load balancer again and again. If you look at the architecture that you see in the standard load balancer here, uh, it is a Azure specified architecture. So you can place your standard load balancer and then you can back end, you can add back end firewalls and then forward traffic to your firewalls for further inspection. Azure came out with uh, uh, layer seven firewall as well. So uh, basic uh, stateful firewalling, traffic filtering, outbound FQDN, they support source NAT and destination NAT. Uh, till this point, uh, we talked about a lot of components of Amazon and Azure. But are we here to discuss the components? Uh, now let's, let's go ahead and talk about security because it's really important to provide similar security in cloud as well, right? If you have your workload in public cloud, that doesn't mean that workload is not important. It is equally important. So if there is a hole in the configuration or if you're using a device which is not capable of doing something that you want, there can be a revenue loss as well. With this, I'll switch over to public cloud security using our next generation firewall and ASA appliances. Now, I'll start off with introduction of what next generation firewall is. It is a stateful firewall which can provide you routing capabilities, application visibility and control. You can use next generation IPS uh, app. So we can, you can install uh, or add uh, a, a term-based license for AMP and you can provide uh, zero-day threat prevention as well. URL filtering, VPN uh, and VPN as well, site-to-site -site and remote access VPN, and we take security intelligence from our, from our database Talos. It has uh, detailed information of what is happening. It is getting feeds from uh, various resources, and we pull those feeds onto our firewall as well to provide threat-centric prevention. So now, um, this device, NGFW, is available in different form factors. It is available on physical appliances, virtual appliances, Amazon, and Azure both. On the management side, we have Firepower Management Center. Uh, think of it as a device which can manage multiple firewalls, and you have visibility. So it will get complete information of what is happening in the network. It has, it has a good uh, dashboard where you can see uh, what user is accessing what, and you can get uh, detailed information there. Apart from that, on the virtual appliances, not in public cloud, it has Firepower Defense Manager as well, uh, FDM, which is an on-box manager. Now on the orchestration side, uh, it is really important that we should orchestrate as well because everybody is moving towards automation and orchestration. So we understand that and we have implemented Firepower Management Center APIs. So we provide built-in API tool, uh, which is known as API Explorer. You can use it and get more information on what is supported. But just to, I will not go through the entire list, but things like device registration, device group, access control policy, interface, these things are really important. If you are provisioning firewalls in cloud, these things are really important. You can add these informations in uh, day zero config as well, or if you want, you can write your Python script and use APIs to configure these, uh, uh, these settings as well. ASA um, is there for a while now, so it is a stateful firewall. Major use case for ASA in public cloud is going to be IPsec or SSL VPN. I've seen customers using it for VPN, like policy-based VPN or route-based VPN in cloud. And on the management side, we have CLI, ASDM, CSM, Cisco Security Manager, and Cisco Defense Orchestrator as well. Now, um, let's talk about security model that is there in the public cloud. It's not enough right now because 
they, the cloud provider is responsible for providing you physical infrastructure security, network security, and virtualization layer security. Now, it is, uh, as a customer, it's your own responsibility to provide security to your workload. So you can, you can either go with basic on, on, or the native security appliances, or you can work on the third-party appliances like Cisco, and you can uh, get the same kind of visibility in cloud as well. Now let's talk about what we have in cloud. What kind of instances, because each device is deployed as an instance in cloud. So we have we tried covering all the regions across the globe. So we have C3 instances. In few regions, C3 instances are not supported. So we have latest C4 instances as well. So we have next generation firewall available in extra large and large instance, uh, uh, firepower management in extra large and two Excel instance as well. We have ASA available as uh, in three different variants. So. If you are deploying uh, it as a, uh, as a large instance, it is going to be ASA v10. If you are doing an extra large instance, it is ASA v30. Now in Azure, we have similar, similar kind of offering, which is standard D3 or D3 v2 instances. On the firepower management side, if you look at uh, FMC, it was not earlier available, and it's not even available today. But with release 6.4, we are going to bring Firepower Management Center in Azure as well. ASA is available. Uh, good part with ASA is if you deploy it on a standard D3 or a standard D3 V2, you get entitlement for all the three. So you can pick and choose between ASA, uh, V5, V10, and V30. So you can license it accordingly based on your requirement. Now let's talk about deployment models. For next generation firewall, deployment models are uh, routed mode only at the moment. Uh, but in AWS, it is passive mode as well because AWS supports ER span. So if you already have some kind of device that, is, that can do ER span, like in this case, we have CSR there. So using CSR, I can do ER span of the traffic and send it to firewall for visibility. So I, I, I've seen, I've been talking to customers where they require only visibility, okay? So in those kind of cases, you can go ahead and deploy firewalls in passive mode, okay? Azure recently came out with a feature known as network virtual tap or virtual network tap. Using that feature, you can also provision next generation firewall in Azure, but that is something which we are validating, and soon we will be bringing that document out for uh, public use as well. Now, on the uh, on the uh, F uh, FMC in public cloud, so again, uh, a little bit of consideration. Uh, virtual FMC can manage up to 25 appliances. Uh, if you are planning to use uh, uh, 25, or if you're planning to monitor firewalls where you want to send a lot of data to it, we would recommend you to go with the larger instance, okay? And then we have ASA. So ASA is available in routed mode only. Uh, it is available in marketplace for GOS and public cloud. Now, this brings us to the important point. I get this question a lot of time about management. How will I manage these devices? Do I have to provide public IP address always? Or I can go ahead and manage my firewalls with private IP as well. So question, answer to this particular question is, it depends on what kind of network you have. So if you have a direct connect or express route, you can definitely disable public IP address from the management interface, and you can manage it through your express route or direct connect. But if that kind of connectivity is not there, then you will definitely need public IP address. Public IP address is not directly assigned to your firewall. There is a mapping between public and private IP address on the provider's gateway side. So you still have NSG or SG security policy, which will protect you if you can use, you can allow only your management workstation to manage your firewalls. Similar cases with ASA as well. Only difference in case of ASA, you can use 
any other interface as management interface as well. So by default, on next generation firewall, uh, ET at zero is your management interface. Same is the case with ASA, but you can manage it using any other interface as well. So imagine if you're using inside interface, you can enable management on inside and you can manage it through that route as well. Now let's go ahead and talk about use cases. Why do you need firewalls in the first place in your public cloud? Before I talk about use cases, let me step back and talk to you about user-defined routes. So user-defined routes are basically required in public cloud, not in the public cloud, everywhere in the network, you need a routing protocol, right? Well, similarly, you have UDRs in public cloud. So you can create a UDR, add routes to your route table, associate your UDR to a subnet. Advantage that you get with this particular UDR is it will overwrite your system routes, okay? And uh, in the next hop option of your route, you have multiple options to pick from. You have virtual appliance. If you want to forward traffic to firewall, you will pick virtual appliance. If you want to send traffic to your uh, VNet peer, you can use uh, VNG or virtual network gateway. If you want to have that network to stay local, you can use next hop as VNet. You can straight away send, to, send this traffic to internet. You can specify internet. And if you want black hole traffic, you can choose none as well. Flexibility of this tool is you can use APIs to modify routes. So if there is a failure of one device, that device can initiate a request and switch route. I'll talk about that when I cover ASA VHA. Now let's look at this particular example here. So when you talk about next generation firewall, we provide four interfaces on the device. So first two interfaces are reserved. First interface is a management interface. Second interface is a diagnostic interface. And then we have two data interfaces. So I get this question a lot of time. I have multiple subnets. How do I use single virtual appliance to manage a lot of, a lot of subnets, right? So, that's, so if you look at this particular example, I have three-tier architecture in my public cloud. So I have web subnet, application subnet, and database subnet. Apart from that, I have external subnet where my external interface is in the external subnet. I have internal subnet. Internal subnet of my firewall is in internal subnet. Now, I also have UDRs. So if you look at web UDR, and if you look at first route, first route is for internet traffic, okay? And I have added route for web application and DC. And if you look at next hop, next hop is firewall. So uh, the moment traffic will leave virtual or workload, VNIC, the moment uh, traffic will leave VNIC of your workload, this UDR will apply. Based on this UDR, traffic will go to firewall for further inspection, where you already have your policies set. And using those policies, firewall will either allow or drop traffic based on your policies. Now, in some cases, uh, micro-segmentation is required also. So you can add a self-subnet route as well. By adding a self-subnet route, what, hap what will happen is if one of your web server is talking to another web server in the same subnet, traffic will leave VNIC, VNIC and it will hit UDR. UDR. UDR will send it to firewall. After applying security policy, traffic will come back to the same subnet. Okay. Now, another thing is you want to place your firewall in such a way that any traffic coming from your data center, that has to be inspected, right? So even if you are terminating your express route on your virtual network gateway, you can still apply UDR, OK? Using this UDR, traffic will go to firewall for inspection. So east-west traffic and north-south north traffic inspection can be handled efficiently by using UDR. Same is the case with ASA. So you can use same uh, deployment model with ASA. However, with ASA, hairpinning of traffic on the same interface is not allowed by default. You can use same security traffic intra-interface command to enable this functionality on ASA. Now, till this point, I talked about single virtual appliance. Now, I, it's time to talk about a HA solution as well, because it is really important. You're moving your workloads to public cloud. 
you would require the same kind of security policies. At the same time, you will need HA as well, right? So that is something which is required. So if you look at this particular network here, we are leveraging two, two, two to three native components of public cloud. Now on the external side of ASA, we have external load balancer, and I have all my public facing IP addresses on my external load balancer. On the internal side of the firewall, I have UDR. So I'm playing with UDR to uh, forward traffic to the active device. Now, this is a separate marketplace offering which came out in version 9.8.1.200, okay? So if you go to marketplace of Azure, you will find two listings. First one is a standalone listing. Second one is HA listing. So you can go ahead and deploy your devices in HA. Now, if you go with this particular marketplace offering, we will provide you built-in HA agent. Now, let's talk about responsibility of HA agent. First responsibility and important responsibility of HA agent is to communicate with peer, just to check whether peer is alive or not, what is the status of the device, whether it is available or it has gone. Second thing is it will respond to probes coming from the load, bal load balancer. Important point to remember in this particular design is HA agent on the active device will only reply to probes coming from load balancer, not the other one, okay? And third important thing is it, your HA agent will initiate REST API call and modify routes in the route table. So imagine if there is a failure in the network, HA agent will go ahead and send a REST API call and switch route in the route table. Users, it is transparent to user because uh, public IP address is on the external load balancer. And, but important thing to remember is it is a stateless solution. So if there is a failure of the device, your end user has to reinitiate that traffic. We are not sharing state or connection table at the moment. We also support multiple subscriptions. So uh, for example, if I have one VNet, I have route table in one subscription, I also have another subscription, uh, I can modify routes in that subscription as well. Fast switch over and stateless switch over. Now, if you look at this particular example here, uh, instead of using external load balancer, because uh, in this particular use case, my user or customer would require ASA to sit between the on-premise environment and cloud environment. So in this particular case, I have multiple UDRs, inside and outside UDRs. So, I, so in the event of failure, ASA, we can go ahead and modify routes in the, in the route, on, in multiple route tables. Now this is an example where I have tried showcasing multiple subscription as well. Now, if you look at this particular example, uh, I have uh, DMZ2 UDR, I have DMZ1 UDR, I have inside UDR, and I also have UDR, which is my partner UDR. Partner is connected to my uh, subscription using VNet peering, okay? So in that case, if there is a failure of HA, I can talk to this UDR also and I can modify routes in this UDR as well. How will I do it? We need to have a proper authenticated mechanism to enable this kind of uh, uh, integration. So I will create app IDs, I will do a proper authentication with that subscription as well. If I'm modifying route in another subscription, I need to have subscription ID, I need to have my app ID, app key, and my app ID should be at least a contributor to make change in the route table. So it's not an unsafe deployment. So if you want to integrate it, you will have a proper authentication mechanism. Now let's move to uh, uh, VPN use cases. Now if you look at VPN, so VPN on firewall, next generation firewall, we have IPsec, SSL VPN, side-to-side -side VPN, Ike V1, Ike V2, we support pre-share key certificates, and we have policy-based VPN at the moment. So, we, so if you look at this particular example, I have terminated all my active connections on first firewall. And in my, in my VPN profile, I have specified 
second device as well. So in the event of failure, if my first device is not reachable, I will make connection to my second device as well. Now, ASA deployment is similar. If you look at this particular deployment, it is similar. Only difference is with ASA, we support two-factor authentication as well. So I do see that I use case, that uh, you, I do see this is a very common use case when you move to cloud or when you can when you use VPN. Now, this is how you will connect your virtual network. Now, you can provision one firewall in your VNet one, second firewall in VNet two, and then you can create your IPsec VPN tunnel. Uh, you can solve problem of uh, overlapping network by enabling NAT on the firewall which is not available on the native VPN gateway. Now, let's talk about deployment. So first of all, when you deploy these devices in public cloud, you can deploy devices using marketplace images. You can go to marketplace, you can search for next generation firewall ASA, and then do the complete visit, type in all the required information and hit deploy. What if you want to deploy multiple firewalls? So in those kind of situations, you might require ARM template deployment as well. So ARM template is a JSON image or a template that you can create. Uh, and um, use case for uh, ARM template is a repeated deployment, with, which is a pretty common use case. Apart from that, there are certain other use cases as well. So, uh, when you deploy any firewall in cloud, it is a mandatory requirement from Azure that it should be in a separate resource group. But if you already have your resource source group, why, why would you create another resource group? If you want to place your firewall in the same subnet, you have to use ARM templates. Other thing is I talked about availability set. So if you are planning to add multiple firewalls behind availability set, it is important that you will go ahead and use it with um, availability set. Now, if you want to deploy firewalls with availability set, you will go with and provide that information in the ARM templates. And you can uh, test your firewalls, publish those templates to your partners, to your customers, and you can reuse uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your research and development rather than reinvest, reinventing the wheel. So we have tested a uh, few ARM templates and made it available for public. And we are also working internally on other templates as well. But if you look at uh, these templates, you can download these templates from GitHub. And we also have YouTube demos on how to use these templates. So the, big, the, the, uh, the latest template that we came out is the load balancer sandwich design. I'll talk about load balancer sandwich design in the next slide. But if you are planning to scale your network in public cloud, you can go to this particular demo. It has step-by-step -step installation um, uh, wizard. So now let's talk about scalable design. So till this point, I talked either about one firewall or HA. But now if you require multiple firewalls, uh, in this example, I have uh, used external load balancer, which is external. It has public IP address, user will come to that particular device. That external load balancer is going to uh, calculate hash, forward it to firewalls. We also have internal load balancer. It is a different kind of load balancer, which is a standard load balancer where you have virtual IP. Now, virtual IP is going to be a very important thing here because that is going to be your next hop. If you look at route table here or UDRs, you will see my virtual IP address of the load balancer is my next hop. So let's talk about traffic flow. So first uh, traffic flow that I'm going to cover is inbound traffic. Users on internet will send traffic to uh, external load balancer. On external load balancer, you will calculate hash, or the load balancer will calculate hash, five tuple, and it will send it to firewall. Now, once we receive traffic on firewall, we are going to source NAT it. Reason for doing the source NAT in public cloud is we need to maintain symmetry of the traffic, okay? So in some cases, uh, you might say that you want to see 
uh, real IP address of the attacker or user. That can be achieved using different means like X forwarder or some kind of other things that you can do. But for maintaining symmetry of the packet, definitely you would require a source NAT here. Now let's look at the outbound traffic use case. So it, th this use case is also important because you will have your servers which will uh, go to internet. These servers will go to internet for downloading web uh, updates or some kind of patches. So again, if you look at UDR, I'm forwarding traffic to virtual IP. The moment traffic is received on virtual IP, I will send it to firewall. Now, with this design, there, I would not say it is a problem, but it is by design. So if you look at this load balancer, this is an external load balancer, and remember I said with external load balancer, you will have to write your road load balancing rule. So imagine if you have load balancing rule here for port 80 or 443, and you were trying to send traffic on port 8000 out to internet from your internal machine, that traffic will not work. In order to solve that particular problem, you can go with this particular design, where you will have dedicated public IP address assigned or mapped to your external interface. Now, let's look at this design as well. In this design, traffic will land on UDR. UDR is going to forward it to internal load balancer. Internal load balancer will forward it to firewall. And now, on firewall, I already have a public IP address. So I don't require external load balancer. So I'll straight away send it to internet using Azure Gateway. OK? Again, source NAT is required here. Now let's look at uh, east-west traffic, uh, because east-west traffic is increasing day by day. So let's look at that as well. Now, imagine if I have my web server, which is talking to my application server. Now in that particular situation, traffic will hit UDR. UDR is going to send the traffic to virtual IP. Virtual IP will send it to firewall, and from there, it will go to application server. Now, on the way back, I also have UDR. Remember, in the previous slide, I showed you UDR, which is applied on application subnet as well, right? So same UDR will apply, and that UDR is going to forward traffic back to ILB. Now, ILB is smart enough to maintain symmetry of packet if it's a single interface. So in this example, you're using single interface of the firewall. So traffic is coming from web, going to ILB, from there to firewall, from firewall to your application machine. Now on the way back, it is going to maintain symmetry because ILB will send it back to the same firewall. So in east-west traffic, you don't require source netting. Another important flow is between your data center and cloud. Now, let's look at this flow. So I have user sitting somewhere remotely, and that user is connecting to my data center, maybe a VPN traffic terminating on my data center. Through that data center, I'm forwarding that traffic to my cloud environment through Express Route. Now, I have this UDR, which is gateway UDR. I have applied it on my gateway subnet. So from there, I can forward that traffic to firewall for inspection. And in this case also, you don't require source NAT because ILB is going to forward the traffic back to the same firewall. Now, uh, there are a few things which we should remember when we deploy um, scalable design. First one is NATing. So if traffic is, is outbound, we are going to NAT it. If traffic is inbound, we are going to NAT it too. And always we'll NAT it to egress interface. Another important thing is NSG. If you are using anything standard, you might require uh, st uh, standard IP or standard load balancer. You will require NSG on the interface to allow traffic. And next hop is going to be ILB in this particular case. Now, uh, how exactly we understand or uh, load balancer will uh, understand that firewall is up and running or not? So you can define probes on your firewall, or on your load balancer, I'm sorry. And there are three different kind of probes available today. So uh, first one is I can probe directly connected interface of firewall. 
Second one is I can probe through the firewall as well if I want to uh, make sure that complete firewall stack is up and running or not, or the far side interface is up and running or not. So I can probe through the firewall. I can even probe for application uh, ports. Um, I, I do see a lot of customers using application ports because rather than checking availability of the firewall, they would like to check application as well. So imagine if, as a customer, I have two availability zones or maybe two subnets, and I have servers behind multiple firewalls. I would like to check availability of my server as well. Obviously, the traffic is going through the firewall. If firewall is not reachable, my probe will go down, and load balancer is going to switch traffic to another firewall. So these are the three load uh, mechanisms. So this one is the first one where I'm using directly connected interfaces. So instead of using any kind of NAT or any access policy, I'm just adding or probing these interfaces directly. Now, uh, the second one is the internal load balancer probing. Now, this is through the uh, appliance probe. So now if you look at this load balancer here, now this load balancer is trying to probe firewall. So in order to use through the firewall probing, I am sending traffic to inside interface. And on inside interface, I'm catching traffic on port 22. Any traffic hitting inside interface on port 22, I'll send that traffic out, uh, to the outside interface, and on the way out, I will translate source and destination. So I'm going to translate my destination to management IP, and I'm going to translate source to my outside IP. This will make sure that traffic through the firewall is up and firewall is completely up, okay? So I'm making sure that my directly connected interface is up, my far side interface is also up. For this, you will require NAT, ACLs, and your routes as well. I have included that configuration in the hidden slide. Uh, that can be easily done using APIs as well. I have a demo where I will show you how exactly we use API to orchestrate this configuration as well. Now, this is for external load balancer. Same kind of thing. Traffic will come on the outside interface on port 22. I'll just catch the traffic, forward it to inside interface, translate source and destination, and enable through the box probing. Another probing is, this is the easiest kind of probing or the reliable probing because I have my application server which is running in my internal network, okay? Instead of probing firewall, I'm probing those servers. I have defined two probes. One probe is going through both firewalls and probing server one, and the other probe is going through the two same firewalls but probing server two. So if my Firewall one is down, load balancer is going to send traffic through firewall two. So for this, for, uh, so whenever you put, a put your application server behind, your, behind firewall, you will always create your NAT and your ACL. This probe is going to use same NAT and ACL. You don't have to worry about creating another set of NAT or ACL rules to enable probing, okay? So this is a probe which, is, uh, which will require least amount of configuration. Another use case is I have seen this coming from a lot of uh, InfoSec team uh, where uh, the requirement is to have separate firewall for internet and separate firewall for, uh, for east-west traffic. Now, if you look at this particular example here, I'm using one internal load balancer, but important thing to remember or check here is I'm using two virtual IPs. First virtual IP address is going to forward traffic to first set of firewall, which is my internet firewall. Second set of firewalls, uh, virtual IP address will forward traffic to second set of firewalls. So this is how I will segregate my internet traffic and each west traffic. Now let's look at the traffic flow. If traffic is inbound, traffic will come to firewall for external load balancer. External load balancer is going to send it to firewall. Firewall will send it to a web server. We do source netting. When traffic is outbound to internet, UDR will force it to virtual IP1, and from there, it will go to internet. Now, if traffic is, again, outbound, but you are using public IP address, it will not go to external load balancer. It will directly go to internet. 
Now, if traffic is east-west, I'm not going to send the traffic to virtual IP1. I'm going to send it to virtual IP2. Because virtual IP2 is pointing to my east-west firewalls. So I'm doing that there. Now, this is another flow where uh, traffic is coming from my data center, going to virtual network. And from this UDR, I'm sending it to virtual IP2. And that way, it, it is going through my east-west firewalls. Another kind of deployment that I see uh, very often is the uh, single arm firewall deployment. So you can have multiple firewalls. You can create your um, service VNet. Uh, let, let me move to this particular diagram here, and then I'll explain it in detail. So now, if you look at this particular example, what we have done is we have a separate service VNet or a transit VNet where you will place all your security devices and you will put it behind internal load balancer. And if you look at UDRs, all the UDRs in your, in your VNets will have IP address of that virtual, or a virtual IP address of that uh, ILB. Now there is a v VNet peering happening already. So any traffic within the VNet or across the VNet also that will come to service VNet for inspection. So if you have a larger deployment where you have multiple VNets, and if you are planning to have a centralized security model, you can go with this particular model as well. With this, I'll start off with a demo on scalable model. So before I start off demo, I'll show you this diagram. I talked about this particular network a few slides ago as well. So I have external load balancer, which is ELB. I have internal load balancer three-tier architecture. Now, uh, I have a virtual IP here, and this virtual IP points to these two next-generation firewalls. And I have uh, external load balancer, so users from internet will hit front-end IP address. So I'll go ahead and uh, talk about, or start my demo first. Yeah, so if you look at this portal, this, in this portal I have my resource group. Under resource group, I have virtual network, and then my external and internal load balancers, right? So I have virtual network, resource group, my internal load balancer, external load balancer, and then I have my UDRs as well. Uh, web UDR, application UDR, database UDR, and I have three servers, in one server in each subnet. Okay, so now I will quickly go ahead and show you uh, configuration, or I'll s quickly show you the virtual network first. Now, if I go to my virtual network and look for subnets, you can see that I have management subnet, diagnostic, outside, inside, web, application. So these are the subnets that I have in my virtual network. Now I'll go ahead and show you configuration of my external load balancer. Now I'm showing you health probes now. If you look at health probe, I'm probing on port 22. And then I have my backend pool. Now if you look at this backend pool, I have, I have added firewalls, external interfaces in the backend pool. So external interface is probing these IPs here, uh, and if Probe will fail. External load balancer is going to remove firewall from the backend pool. Now, next thing is my load balancing rule. On the external load balancer, I have to write rule if I want to forward traffic. So this is my external, this is my rule there. I have this front-end IP address as well, so all my external users will go to this front-end IP. And since I have my firewalls in the backend pool, based on the load balancing rule, traffic will then land on the firewall. Now let me show you internal load balancer as well. Again, I'm probing on port 22. I'll go to backend pool. And in this backend pool, you can see that I have 
internal interfaces of the device. Now, let's look at the load balancing rule here, uh, okay? This is my front-end IP, I'm sorry. This front-end IP address is going to be next hop in my UDRs. So if I want to send any traffic, whether it's outbound or east-west, I'm going to use this IP address as my next hop in my UDRs. This is my load balancing rule. Important thing to remember or check here is the load balancing rule. Instead of defining port, I have HA port functionality enabled. So any traffic coming on UDP or TCP will land up on uh, backend firewalls. Now let's look at UDRs now. So UDR, <coughs> if you look here carefully, I have dot 100, which is virtual IP address of my load balancer. And this is my next hop in my UDR and it is associated to web subnet. I have similar kind of UDRs created for application and database subnet as well. So I'll quickly go through those UDRs as well. So this one is a web UDR. Now I'm going to show you application UDR. Same thing, next hop is ILB and associated to application subnet. So I'm just creating UDRs and forcing traffic to load balancer so that it can receive it and forward traffic there. Similar kind of UDRs and now let's go, let's go back to this example here. So I've shown you my virtual networks, subnets, my firewalls, external load balancer, internal load balancer, and I've also showed you UDRs as well. In the UDR, traffic is going to uh, load balancer. Now, uh, now let's go ahead and check our firepower management center as well. Now on the firepower management center, this is a management console for fire, firewalls. So you can see I have both firewalls listed there. Both firewalls are managed by same device. I'm using same, same security or access control policy for both devices. Now I'm showing you interface configs as well. So these are my interface configs. So both firewalls are there. I have routes as well. Remember I talked about through the firewall uh, probing, so I'm using these routes, and we deployed these routes using APIs. So I'll talk about that in the next demo where I will show you orchestration of the, these devices. So these are the routes required for outside, inside, and as well as my probes as well. So this is config from second firewall. Same kind of routes. So I need to reach my outside and management interface, same kind of routes. And all the screenshots are there in the hidden slides as well. So if you're planning to deploy it, there is a demo on YouTube as well as all the screenshots are there in the hidden slides as well. Now, let me show you this policy. For this uh, demo purpose, I have allowed everything. So now, let me show you my NAT policies as well. Because I, I talked about natting as well when, when I was talking about probes, right? So I, I need to translate my source and destination. So those uh, uh, nats are done here. So again, config is there in, in, in the deck. So now let's look at this example here. So this is my firewall one on the right hand side. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm just using CLI. I could have shown it on the um, on the management console as well, but it's easier to show everything on single window here. So I have my external firewalls, or firewall one, firewall two, and I have these three subnets as well. So these are three servers. So I have web server, application server, and data, uh, database server. So I'm going to show you IPs of both firewalls first, and then I'm going to initiate few ping uh, requests from these servers. So from this machine, I'm trying to ping another machine in another subnet. You can see that fire, this request is received on firewall two, okay? Now I'm going to ping from other side, from another device. And you can see that request is received on other device as well. So instead of using one device in active passive mode, we are using both firewalls. So 
there is a difference when you move to public cloud, when you pay for resources, why do you want to keep that resource as a passive resource? If you are paying for that particular device, why can't we use it? So you can use this load balancer or a scalable design, forward traffic to multiple devices, and have an active-active solution. Now, uh, another thing I want to highlight here is uh, if, for some reason, my firewall 2 is down, or if I go ahead and switch it down deliberately, what will happen? So the moment I will uh, turn it off, my, load, uh, my probes will break. And the, the moment probes will, probes will break, it is removed from the load balancer. Now let's, let's go and check our backend pool again. You can see second firewall is not reachable. The moment you will bring it back within a few minutes, the moment probes are up, it, it is added again. If you want to add a new firewall, you can add another firewall, create a new <laughs> firewall, add it to the same availability zone, put it in both load balancers, and you're good to go. So you can scale as and when required. So today, if you are starting with a small network, you can start off with N plus one, maybe initially two firewalls, and later on you can build on top of that as well. So this, is, this demo is about that. Now with this, let's move on to Amazon Web Services use cases. So cloud providers are pretty much the same. So use cases are exactly similar, but I will go ahead and talk about things which are really different in Amazon. So for VPN, similar kind of deployment, we have uh, ASA, next generation firewall, available in Amazon as well. Uh, you can play with your route table. Uh, in this particular example, if you look here, I have two firewalls. First one is acting as an active device. Second one is acting as a standby device. Now, uh, why we are not able to provide active active solution here is the reason of the way route table is defined in Amazon. So in Amazon, uh, when you create a route table, there is a pre-added route, which is the route for your CIDR range. For example, if I create a virtual private cloud as 192.168.00 slash 16, I will have a pre-installed route in my route table. I cannot override it by adding a more specific route. That is something they are working on. And because of that particular reason, we are not able to provide active-active solution here in Amazon Web Services. Now on the ASA side, two-factor authentication again uh, is available on ASA. Apart from that, route-based and policy-based VPN is there. So things are pretty much similar, only things which are not supported or which are different, I'll cover that here. Um, again, same kind of deployment for your VPC peering as well. So VPC peering, uh, you can add firewalls. Same thing if you have overlapping submits, it is pretty difficult to have uh, uh, to use the native uh, VPC client or uh, VGW. So you can provision ASA or next generation firewall and use it. ASA is also available uh, in the same designing model. You can connect two VPCs which are out of the same region as well. So uh, if you have few devices, few VPCs in US region, few VPCs in Europe region, you can still create your VPN tunnel. Now let's look at this particular example. So this is similar to service VNet that I talked about. Uh, this one is a hub and spoke model. So I have this virtual private cloud, and I have VPN as well, so ASA. Uh, ASA. ASA is doing route-based VPN. So we introduced route-based VPN in version 9.7.1. So you can use this particular model, create your route-based VPN, advertise your route. It can be through BGP, or you can advertise your stat static routes as well. You can create your tunnel interfaces, and whatever routes your devices are learning, based on that, your traffic or your IPsec in encryption will happen because you're going to forward that traffic to your tunnel interface, and from there, it will go to the destination tunnel interface. Uh, this is uh, another kind of use case where you already have your AWS VPN connection, and in your data center, you have ASA. So you can set up your VPN connection there as well. Now this one is secure transit VPC design. 
if you look at this secure transit VPC design, uh, it is similar to service VNet. But if you look at this particular example, we have one firewall here, right? So traffic from internet will go to this firewall, this firewall will then forward it to one of the CSRs. So in this example, instead of using ASA, I'm using CSR for connecting to my spoke VPCs as well. Now let's talk about cloud formation template. Again, in AWS, you have two deployment models. You can go to marketplace, search for the image, add all the values, click deploy. Other thing is, if you're planning to deploy multiple devices, you can create your stack. It is, again, a JSON objects that you can add in the stack. Now, if you look at this example, uh, we, we have deployed it in one of the labs. So we presented a lab yesterday at Cisco Life where we had this particular model. And everything that, see, that you see here on right-hand side is deployed using a cloud formation template. So using a cloud formation template, what we did is we went ahead and created a complete stack. And as part of that stack, we defined that a person or uh, admin will have a virtual private cloud, will have four subnets, will have workloads, firewalls, load balancers, uh, and route table, and internet gateway. So it's not that you, will, you can deploy only firewall, you can create your stack. With your firewall, you can deploy other things as well. So if you look at this object here, this is a scalable model, which I'm going to discuss in the next slide. But everything in this uh, diagram that you see is deployed by a cloud formation template. So you don't have to worry about how can I go ahead and add a firewall, how will I go ahead and add load balancer. So everything is done by this. Uh, cloud formation template. Now let's uh, jump into scalable design. Now this scalable design is achieved using few native components. Uh, first one is network load balancer. Again, so if you see this network load balancer, this is a native component of Amazon Web Services available there. Uh, in this example, I'm using next generation firewall, probing my firewalls again. I can probe interface of the firewall, I can also probe through the firewall, or I can probe, or I can use traffic probe as well. So in this example, this load balancer that you see here can forward traffic across availability zones as well. So if uh, you have two, uh, if you have your deployment in multiple availability zones, you can add external load balancer. And in the backend pool, you can have multiple firewalls. Few firewalls can be in availability zone one. Few firewalls can be in availability zone two as well. So in case, if your availability zone one is down, your business is not down, you will have your services up and running through availability zone two as well. So uh, in Azure also, they came out with uh, availability zone concept pretty quickly, and we are working on bringing the same kind of designing model for Azure side as well. We don't see any challenge. It has been tested properly. We'll go ahead and publish that pretty quick, maybe in a couple of weeks or maybe in a month. Similar kind of design will be supported there as well. But the important point is to remember that your um, traffic forwarding is not limited to a specific availability set, availability zone, I'm sorry. You can forward traffic across the availability zones as well. Now, same uh, model for ASA is also there. So. Um, there is no difference. You can use it as well. Uh, only thing is, on ASA, uh, you have, by default, you have four interfaces. So first interface is a management interface. You can use it for data as well. So you can use CLB as well. If you are already using your classical load balancer, classical load balancer can forward traffic only to primary interface of a VM. Now, if you're using ASA, you can configure your ASA in such a way that your primary interface will become data interface as well, which is a default setting. You can change that as well. Uh, so you can use NLB or CLB. But with next generation firewall, it is always NLB. Now, this demo is for showcasing power of uh, scripting, uh, adding firewalls using a cloud formation template, building the entire stack from scratch, adding firewalls. So this, by end of this demo, everything is deployed. 
by a cloud formation template. Now, if you look at this network here, let me go through this design pretty quick. So in this design, what will happen is cloud formation template will go ahead and deploy virtual private cloud. And this cloud formation template is designed to deploy devices in two availability zones, zone 1C and 1D. Now, each availability zones will again have multiple subnets, inside, outside, management, and diagnostic, which I have not shown here, but there is a diagnostic subnet as well. Once these subnets are deployed, cloud formation template will go ahead and deploy workloads, WL1 and WL2. These are workloads in different availability zones and different subnets. Cloud formation template will then go ahead and deploy firewalls and next uh, and the NLB as well. Cloud formation template will then go and add these firewalls in NLB and ensure that probes are up. But the moment you deploy your firewall, probes will not come up. So you will have to go to your API client, initiate API calls, or initiate your Python script, and Python script will then go ahead and initiate or contact your Firepower Management Center, which is again deployed by your cloud formation template. So API client will talk to Firepower Management Center, and Firepower Management Center will then, then push that configuration down to firewalls. This cloud formation template is going to provide internet gateway as well and route table, because if, if I'm using internet, I should have these two components as well. So things which will be orchestrated by this uh, script is device registration. So I need to register my device to my Firepower Management Center. Next important thing is I need to create objects, because I will be using those objects somewhere in access policy, somewhere in NAT, somewhere in route. So I will use uh, uh, the API calls to create objects. Access control policy is required because I want to control what is allowed, what kind of things I want to permit through the firewall. Interface configurations. The moment your firewall will come up, it will have base IP config, OK? But if you want to create your security zones, you want to assign interfaces to security zones, that I'm doing using my Python script. NAT and static routes are also done by, uh, by the cloud formation template. So I will quickly show you this demo. So first of all, this is a place. This is Amazon uh, Web Services Console. And if I go in my services, and if I look for cloud formation, you will come to this particular page. There is a create stack. We have created our cloud formation template already. It is saved in our S3 bucket. So S3 bucket is our storage where I have that cloud formation template. So I'm going to hit create stack. And on this screen, I will go ahead and specify location of my cloud formation template. OK? So here, uh, now, now when I click Next, it will present a form for me. Now, in this form, I'm going to add values, OK? So I will specify this stack name, OK? For example, if you want to create a stack for finance department, you can write finance and then enter these values, OK? So first one is stack name, then we have pod number, because this is for lab, so we created a pod for every user. But in, in your case, it can, it, it can be a VNet name as well, or VPC name as well. So uh, I added um, a key here as well. So if you look at this key, so all the workloads that you will deploy in Amazon Web Services will require a key because that is their uh, requirement. So if I create a web server and I want to access that web server using SSH, rather than using username and password, I will be using this key. So I have specified this key there. Then I'm going to define names of my firewalls. Now I'm going to put all the interfaces in correct subnets. Remember, in the previous diagram, I showed you that firewall will have four subnets. So I'm just putting all the four subnets in the correct 
uh, VLANs or subnets, four, all the four interfaces and correct subnets. So for first firewall, I'm going to use uh, availability zone 1C, and for second firewall, I'm going to use availability set or uh, availability zone 1D. So now if you look at this example here, I have 1D, which is my second availability zone, and 1C is my first availability zone. So I'm going to deploy these devices accordingly. And I will click Next. So once, uh, once everything is done on the form, I will click Deploy. So I'm at the phase where my script started deploying things, OK? So I'll quickly show you a couple of items here. So it deployed a lot of things, right? My interfaces, Elastic IP, it deployed VNet and everything. So um, CloudFormation template went ahead and deployed complete network infrastructure for me. Now, let me go ahead and show you instances that CloudFormation went ahead and deployed. Firewalls are now getting initialized at this moment because when you deploy any workload using a CloudFormation template, it will take some time to initialize. Because on the firewall, it, it will take three to four minutes to initialize, and once firewalls are up and running, you can add those firewalls in Firepower Management Center. So firewalls are now getting initialized. Okay, now let's look at the next step, which is looking at the load balancer. So I have network load balancer too. Now if you look at this load balancer, and if you look at uh, information here, I have a target group. Now I talked about target group as well. What is a target group? It is an IP address where I want to forward traffic to. So I have created a target group as well using my cloud formation template. And in the target group, I have IP addresses of my firewall. So till this point, if you see, my targets are unhealthy because CloudFormation template only went ahead and deployed my base infrastructure, my firewalls. There is no config on the firewall as of now. Okay, these are uh, interfaces which are in initialization state right now or there is no config on the device at the moment. Yeah. OK. So now if you look at this, firewalls are initialized. But still, there is no config, because we have not initiated our API client. Now I'll go back in Firepower Management Center, and I'll show you that there is no config at the moment. So the firewalls are completely blank. So. There's nothing, no firewall, no NAT rule, no object rule, nothing. So it's completely blank. Now next step is I will log into my API client. Now AP, API client is just my Linux box with Python 2.7 installed. Uh, not a very, uh, 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 not a machine where you have a lot of packages, just 2.7 Python. Now this is my API client. I, I'm inside my API client and I have this Python script. Okay, so this Python script will go ahead and add all the config. It will not add config directly to the firewall. It will talk to Firepower Management Center. And from Firepower Management Center, the policies will come down to firewalls. Now, I have initiated this script. This script is going to talk to Firepower Management Center. So I have submitted registration of the firewalls. So I'll go back to FMC. Registration is in progress right now. So it will go through phases, different phases, discovering device, adding policies, adding firewalls, adding access control policies. All these things will happen. And then I have added a delay in my script. Once these things are done, I will go back to my script, and I will type done. 
So now at this, at this stage, I am going to initiate um, a request using which I will initialize my interfaces, routes, access control policies, everything. So I have initiated that, and based on that, everything is getting added. So I will go ahead and show you devices now. If you look at the devices now, earlier there was no device. After adding the or running access control or the uh, API, uh, the Python script, devices are added. Now I am showcasing all the interfaces configs here. NAT config is there now. Access control policy is also uh, added. Objects are also added. Now let's go to load balancer again. Since I have my configuration available on firewall, it is pushed by FMC, initiated by API client. I should see both firewalls are now healthy because the moment I added NAT statements, access control policies, I will have my target groups. I should have my target groups as healthy. Now if I go to targets now, you can see these are healthy. So my load balancer is probing my <laughs> firewalls, and it, since it, it is getting proper reply, it is treating this device as healthy device. Now, if I, uh, there is, on the load balancer, there is a DNS name. So instead of front-end IP address, if you deploy load balancer in Amazon Web Services, they give you a DNS name. So if I take the DNS name out, and if I go and put it in the uh, browser, it is going to take my request to two different firewalls across the availability zone. So I just wanted to show you power of uh, cloud formation template, APIs, how exactly you can merge all the three to create an environment which is completely orchestratable. So you can bring your firewalls. So if you are working for a client where they require, uh, they are working on a deployment environment where they need similar kind of setup every day or every, every week, you can use these kind of scripts and you can make your uh, work easy. Now, with this, I will move to advanced use cases, okay? So, um, in advanced use cases, I want to highlight uh, that we can integrate with other products as well. So, we have a lot of products in Cisco uh, security domain, so we can integrate well with other products as well. First thing, or the biggest use case that I see for customers is uh, 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 advanced malware, okay? So now if you look at this example here, why, why do we need uh, threat prevention? Because if there is something which is a day zero attack, how exactly you will go ahead and protect your network? So I will talk about integration with AMP. Uh, it's as simple as adding a license on your device. If you have that license, we are, you are good to go. It will talk to the AMP cloud. So there is an AMP cloud or on-premise AMP as well. So, uh, so I'll talk about that. Umbrella connector. So how many of you are aware of what umbrella is? Okay, I can see a lot of hands. Okay, so I'll talk about umbrella as well. So we have ASA umbrella connector. Um, which will intercept your DNS traffic and send it to uh, DNS resolver in Umbrella and so that you get that threat prevention based on IP and domain names. And I will talk about tel stealth watch for cloud as well. Now, there is nothing really special that you need to do on your device. So if you look at this example, uh, in this example, you have your external web servers uh, on the internet. So anybody, and you have allowed everything. Anybody on port 80 or 443 is allowed to access these servers, right? Now, what will happen if your web server is compromised? You have next generation firewall sitting between your front end or DMZ and your databases, right? So traffic will go through the firewall. Now, since you have AMP license applied on the firewall, Firewall will detect, and you're doing file policy on the device. So what file policy is, it will look at the file, and it will look for any anomaly. So if, if it finds a malware, it is going to instantly drop it. If file is new, it will talk to, um, do various things in the background, like it will talk to 
uh, Talos, get the verdict. Those things, I'm not going to discuss that here because that is another session, a big session, if you want to understand in detail how AMP will mitigate attacks. But just to give you some idea, the moment you add a term-based license, which is available in one, three, and five years, you can enable, you can enable network AMP here as well. For the uh, integration, you can integrate it with AMP Cloud, or if you're planning to have on-prem AMP, there is a thread grid integration available as well. Now, let's move on to next topic, which is umbrella connector for ASA. Um, you can integrate your ASA uh, with umbrella cloud as well. Now, what umbrella cloud is, umbrella cloud will uh, provide you visibility and it will enforce traffic based on DNS layer. It will uh, block any traffic at the first layer. When you start a request, you try to go to a website. First thing that you will do is you will try to resolve that IP address. So at the first layer, it is going to check with DNS or umbrella resolver and it will give you a verdict whether this domain or IP is malicious or not. If yes, then you can take actions accordingly. This kind of integration is done with the ASA API keys and tokens. So when you register for umbrella, you get your token. So you will add that information on the ASA. It can be added on the on-premise ASA or ASA running in Amazon Cloud or Azure. Uh, you, can, uh, you can then uh, Integrate your ASA using ASA connector. The moment that integration is in, in place, any DNS request going through the device is intercepted by ASA. And we are going to rewrite our DNS address with our umbrella DNS resolver. Based on that, uh, different actions can be taken. So let me quickly show you how exactly it will happen. So if you have a client uh, in your cloud, it can be your application server talking to something on the internet. It can be a web server or something. The, the moment DNS request is initiated, it is intercepted by ASA. Then it will go to, since ASA is going to rewrite DNS, it will go to uh, umbrella, uh, umbrella um, recursive servers. And from there, you, you will go ahead and get the verdict. If contact, uh, if, if the IP or domain name that you are trying to reach is malicious, you can take action. You can present a block content page, or if traffic or the destination is clean, you can send it to the destination website as well. Another integration is uh, StealthWatch for Cloud. We have uh, StealthWatch for Cloud available, uh, which will get information from various sources within cloud. So you can uh, get information from VPC flow log, different kind of uh, uh, additional data sources are there. So you can get uh, uh, flow logs from there, and then you can get complete visibility of what is happening in the network. Now with this, uh, I'm at the point where I will discuss about licensing, because licensing is really important to understand when you deploy firewalls in, in, in the cloud. Uh, now, firewall, uh, next generation firewall is with base license. With base license, you get firewalling functionality, application visibility, and control. We have term-based licenses available for threat, URL, and NAMP, which is going to be in one, three, and five years. On licensing uh, in Amazon, we have bring your own license. We also have hourly or annual license. In Azure, we only have bring your own license, so we support uh, smart licensing, so you will add your license, you will purchase licenses directly from Cisco, add it to your smart account, and consume on your virtual devices. ASA is, again, similar kind of uh, licensing that we follow. It is uh, similar to what we have for on-premise virtual ASA. So you have standard license, which will give you uh, licensing, uh, firewalling, and throughput. So you can pick from between uh, 500 meg, one gig, two gig. So that kind of thing is controlled by standard license. For any connect, uh, the SSL VPN, you have Apex licenses available. Um, on the Amazon, you have bring BYOL as well as hourly license or annual license available. In Azure, it's only BYOL. Now, for ASA V entitlement, uh, things are a little bit different. Uh, when you will install the device, it is going to be either standard D3 or D3 V2, 
or it is, if it is uh, uh, AWS, it is going to be uh, large or extra large. But we give you flexibility of using any entitlement. If you want to have a smaller uh, ASA throughput, you can purchase license for ASA v5, v10, or v30, whatever you, you want. Apart from that, if you want to know exactly how much uh, is the cost of running or compute cost for running these virtual appliances, you can go to AWS cal calculator. You can also go to Azure calculator to understand how exactly you will be built for running these virtual appliances. And uh, now let, let me go ahead and talk about important resources. So if you are uh, going into the cloud and you're pretty new, you want to see something which is uh, a new field for you. So you can go to this particular YouTube channel. Here we have created a lot of videos on as simple as how can I deploy ASA using a AWS or Azure visit? How will I route traffic to firewall for inspection? Because it involves different components, right? Like, like your route table, your uh, UDR. So things might be a little bit different. So that, that can be your first starting point uh, when you move to public cloud. Also, we have technical decision maker decks available, specifically for Azure and AWS. So if you have partner level access, you can go to this link and download uh, these files. Now, uh, th th these are the links for uh, marketplace listings. So if you want to read more about marketplace listings, what exactly a device is, and what are the key resources, you can go to these links as well. Now let's go ahead and summarize this uh, entire uh, presentation in one deck. So uh, security is really important when you are in data center or when you move to cloud. It's more important when you move into cloud because in public cloud, you have a public access as well. In data center, it might be blocked access. You have controls. But in public cloud, you should have complete visibility. And how will you get that visibility? You can, you can have same kind of security model that you have in your data center extended to public cloud as well. Now, on the licensing side, it is pretty flexible. If you are using licenses in your data center, same kind of license model is available for cloud. Uh, in Amazon, things are a little bit different. It has the hourly or annual license as well. Important thing is, if you are going with hourly or annual license, I know in some use cases, uh, you might require hourly or annual license because your project is small, maybe five or 10 days or maybe a month. Instead of purchasing complete license, you might go for uh, uh, hourly license as well. But if you go for hourly license, there is no tax support by default. In the deck, I have added a link where you can go, and that link will point you to resellers from where you can purchase one year tax support for these virtual appliances. But if you go with BYOL, tax support is by default the way you do it for other appliances on prem. We have features like threat, URL, and AMP which will give you complete visibility of what is happening. You can integrate it with Umbrella. You can uh, have it with Stealth Watch. You will have complete visibility. Cloud formation templates, we have published a few templates already. And uh, we have received requests from uh, various sales teams, customers, and partners. We are working and testing other uh, cloud formation templates as well, just to make your deployment and work easier. We are working on that, and we will soon go ahead and uh, publish those kind of templates as well. Scalable model is available from uh, by using native components like NLB, um, CLB, standard or uh, uh, standard or basic load balancer. ASAV HA uses the HA uh, uh, HA agent, which is available in marketplace. We are uh, thinking of having similar kind of model for next generation firewall as well. But based on our discussion with customers and partners, industry is going towards active, active kind of environment where if they are in cloud, they would like to have all the firewalls forwarding traffic rather than active passive. So we are thinking on those lines as well. And then on the, on, on the orchestration side, uh, we have REST APIs available for FMC, REST API available for ASA, you can orchestrate your configuration and make your deployment easier. Uh, with this, I'm at the end of the session, and uh, thank you guys. Thank you for your time in the morning. I understand early morning coming here, it's pretty difficult. But thanks again. Thanks for being here, and 
Thanks for listening to me. Have a good day ahead. And feel free and go and fill, fill out survey. It means a lot. We'll go ahead and uh, based on your feedback, it's, it, it, that will inspire us for next Cisco Live as well. So if you want to see me here again talking to you on, on different uh, cloud integration, feel free and uh, fill out surveys. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. Thank you.